Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are, and thank you for joining us today for the virtual roundtable discussion on East Med, the trilateral agreement between Greece, Israel, Cyprus, and its role in regional energy security and economic cooperation. This event is organized by the American Hellenic Chamber of Commerce and the Atlantic Council in cooperation with the Israel American Chamber of Commerce and the American Chamber of Commerce in Cyprus. It is a great pleasure to be part of today's event, as we have been discussing with our partners at the Atlantic Council and our colleagues in the Amchams of Israel and Cyprus since before the outbreak of the pandemic. Energy has shaped the modern world as we know it. The current problem that the world faces is the transition from the use of heavily polluting fuels to more environmentally friendly sources of energy. Natural gas is key to making the transition smoother and cost effective. Over the past decade, in the region of the East Mediterranean, the, the region has attracted attention by the hydrocarbons upstream industry with the discoveries in the Levantine Basin. The discoveries of recoverable gas reserves in the Zohar fields in Egypt, Leviathan in Israel, and Aphrodite in Cyprus brought the region in the spotlight of international exploration and production activity. These discoveries have contributed and will contribute even more to the economies of the corresponding countries, as well as these of Greece and perhaps Lebanon. The agreement for the construction of the East Med pipeline that will transfer natural gas from the Levantine Basin through Greece to the rest of Europe is a project that brings together Israel, Cyprus and Greece and potentially more countries. The Eastern Mediterranean Security and Energy Partnership Act, signed by US President Trump in late 2019, and the subsequent authorization for the establishment of an Eastern Mediterranean Energy Center, shows the interest in Greece in the US for the region and the belief that energy can help in bridging the distance among countries. Lastly, the foundation in 2020 of the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum which will be based in Egypt with the participation of Cyprus, Egypt, Greece, Israel, Italy, Jordan, and the Palestinian Authority will contribute in the dialogue among the countries. The outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, with a subsequent drop in hydrocarbons demand, resulted in lower commodity prices, which in turn led, led to the rescheduling of some activities in the area. However, this does not in any way diminish or cancel the importance of energy as a catalyst to change in the region. Change that not only has to do with the energy sector, but other areas, such as trade and knowledge transfer in all sectors of business and science. And this is what we'll be discussing today. Last January, during uh, the visit of the Greek Prime Minister to Washington, D.C., the Atlantic Council the American Hellenic Chamber of Commerce signed a partnership agreement for the support of the Council's Future Europe Initiative and its work on securing US Greece leadership in the energy transition. Today's event is a result of the excellent relationship that we have built with the Atlantic Council and, of course, our fellow Anchans of Cyprus and Israel, with which we have already signed an MOU in order to foster and enhance economic and business cooperation between our countries. On behalf of the American Hellenic Chamber of Commerce, I am extremely thankful to all our partners for this event, as well as the great lineup of speakers who participate in today's high level event. I wish everyone a constructive dialogue. And with that, I would like to pass the digital, the virtual floor to Ben Haddad, the future Europe Initiative Director of the Atlantic Council. Ben, you have to go. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nikos. Uh, good morning for those watching in the United States. Good afternoon in Greece and all over Europe. I'm Ben Haddad. I'm the director of the Future Europe Initiative at the Atlantic Council in Washington. It's my pleasure to join our friends and partners of the American Atlantic Chamber of Commerce for this conversation today on EASMED, the trilateral partnership and its role in energy security and economic cooperation in the age of COVID-19 and beyond. I'd like to thank uh, Nikos Baketzeros, Elias Pritunas, our friends at AmCham that we've been privileged to work with so closely in Athens 
and in Washington, and we hope to uh, see you again in real life very soon. I'd also like to thank and greet Ambassador Pyatt, uh, a longstanding friend of the Atlantic Council in, in Athens. The Atlantic Council is founded on the mission that the United States is stronger with its allies, that the transatlantic relationship is its best asset, especially in this time of crisis. As we face the health, economic, and geopolitical consequences of COVID-19, the relationship with the European Union is central to our work. This is why we launched this year our US-EU at 70 campaign to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the coal and steel community and look at how we can tackle future challenges together. Since the beginning of this crisis, the Atlantic Council has gone on offense, offering a bipartisan platform to global leaders, providing solutions for international cooperation, and staying close to our partners and our friends across the world. In this respect, our partnership with Greece is at the center of our work. In the last years, we have seen in Greece a key strategic ally in the United States, in the Western Balkans, in promoting energy security in the Eastern Mediterranean with Cyprus and Israel, a strong ally within NATO and the European Union. It permeates the work of our different centers, and I'm particularly glad today that we're joined by the chairman of our energy center, Ambassador Morningstar. This big bet on Greece is why we were honored to host Prime Minister Mitsotakis and key members of his cabinet during his visit in uh, Washington in January. When Prime Minister Mitsotakis spoke at the Atlantic Council, he spoke of a Greece that would punch above its weight on the world stage and provide solutions for others. We have seen this in, his, in the successful handling of the pandemic, and we see this today in Athens' leadership in the Mediterranean. This is why I'm very glad that we're having this conversation today with, with our friends all across the region. Thanks to all. And let me now turn to my colleague, Katerina Soku, who will moderate uh, the discussion today. Okay, here we are. Uh, greetings from me as well. Uh, welcome to what I like to call the, our virtual three plus one meeting. I'm Katerina Soko, I'm a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and the correspondent for Kathy Marini and Sky TV in Washington DC. Unfortunately, these days I'm, uh, I'm confined, uh, I'm isolated in Canada. I cannot return right now in uh, the US while all these uh, uh, events are taking place. Uh, so my heart goes to DC today. Uh, I know it doesn't be traveling to the region, to any of the countries in the region, but uh, I wish we all get an opportunity to do so again soon. Uh, for today, I promise uh, we will compensate with the insights of some key policymakers and business leaders uh, from the region and the US. The trilateral partnership between Greece, Israel and Cyprus is fast developing on various different fronts, but energy has arguably been at the center of it, the initial driver and still one of the most important aspects of the partnership. Indeed, the support of the US has contributed to, now, to what we now call three plus one with high level meetings taking place in the last few years throughout the region. At the same time, Congress has also passed the East Med Act asking for American support, further American support for the trilateral partnership, especially on energy and defense for these three stable, democratic and predictable American allies in the region. At the same time, other uh, partnerships uh, are, are also being developed in the region and we have, uh, including with uh, another trilateral with Greece, Cyprus and Egypt, uh, with the participation of uh, France as well, the goal is to work together, the wider goal, and of course, the East Met Gas Forum. And the goal is to work together for energy security and efficiency, not only for its individual country, but also for the region as a whole. This is the leap forward that some see parallels with uh, the creation of the European coal and steel community. Indeed, Europe is also interested in the East Med energy collaboration, both as a potential source of gas for its own market, but also as a factor for economic development and security in the East Med region. 
So this is a, both a political and a geoeconomic aspect to this dynamic. And today we will have the opportunity to discuss both, starting with our first round table of, of uh, and if we may please bring uh, the, uh, the, our first uh, round table for participants uh, to the front while I'm introducing them, we will have the Energy Minister of Israel, Dr. Yuval Steinitz, the Energy Minister of Greece, Kostis Katidakis, of Cyprus, George Dakotripis, together with the U.S. Ambassador uh, to Greece, Jeffrey Payand, and of course, Ambassador Richard Morningstar from the Atlantic Council. He's the founder, as then head of the Global Energy Center, and a former U.S. Ambassador to Azerbaijan and the European Union. I should mention that Assistant Secretary Francis Fanon, Fanon from the Bureau of Energy Resources of the State Department will also be joining us in a little while. But without further ado, uh, let me begin our discussion with our speakers and kick off the conversation with a question first directed to the three ministers. Uh, how do you assess the development of the trilateral partnership on energy so far? And how, do you, how does it fit specifically to your country's energy strategy? And if I may start with uh, Dr. Steinitz. Hello, good afternoon and thank you. And I'm uh, very glad uh, to be here with my two dear colleagues and friends uh, from uh, Cyprus and uh, Greece, with uh, Minister Hajidakis and Minister uh, Lakotripis. We, we are not only colleagues, but uh, during the years we became uh, also friends. I want to start by, uh, by thanking the American Chamber of Commerce and the Atlantic Forum for uh, organizing this meeting and uh, I want to tell you that uh, our hearts and hopes is with the United States of America and its brave people. Uh, we know that it's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult time with the pandemic in the United States and with the, with the unrest of the last uh, week, but I'm confident that, uh, like always, the United States will prevail and will remain uh, number one uh, uh, superpower and the uh, real leader of the democratic world that we all so cherish. So first I want to, I'm confident I'm speaking also on behalf of my colleagues from uh, Greece and Cyprus to share our our uh, sympathy and hope with the United States in those, uh, 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 during those uh, difficult days. Uh, with regard to our cooperation, really the three countries, uh, we can speak on uh, additional countries, of course, but uh, let's focus on, uh, on uh, uh, Cyprus, Greece and Israel, because we actually uh, started this regional cooperation that is now uh, the circles are growing. Um, uh, really, energy, as you mentioned, uh, play a key role in it. Although we have a wonderful cooperation, a growing cooperation also in many other fields, the main two ones are uh, security, counterterrorism, and also uh, tourism. Uh, so, uh, um, I, I think that this is a major step for Israel. It's extremely important. And uh, let's first focus on the main issue that was already mentioned. Following the discoveries of very large, significant gas fields in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, in Israel, Cyprus, and also in Egypt, but Egypt is uh, still uh, need to consume most of its uh, natural gas, it's a big country. So let's focus on Cyprus and Israel. Uh, it became evident for us that uh, we will have to export most of the natural gas since uh, Israel and Cyprus are not very big countries. Uh, and uh, therefore we join together first with the Greeks and later on also with the Italians and to a certain extent also with the European Union to explore the possibility of exporting gas from the Eastern Mediterranean uh, to the European Union. 
או רכיבים מאוד ספציפיים, טרום ישראל וסייפרוס, to Greece and through Greece to Italy and through Greece and Italy to the rest of uh, Europe. Uh, this uh, looks very ambitious. You can do it either by LNG, and we are trying to export some LNG gas from Egypt, but uh, the best uh, 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 way to do it and also to ensure uh, economic security and energy security for both sides is through a, a pipeline, a cross Mediterranean pipeline. And therefore, already two and a half years ago, we began to discuss the East Med a gas pipeline uh, or the cross Mediterranean gas pipeline, which is going to be the longest and deepest uh, underwater, under sea uh, gas pipeline. The aim is to export a lot of gas from the Eastern Mediterranean to Europe, or as I put it, so far Europe uh, relied mainly on two sources, on two main sources of natural gas. The Northern Sea, fields belong mainly to Norway, Holland, Britain, and Denmark, and uh, from the East, and Russia, from Siberia. One of these uh, main sources, the Northern Sea, is already on the verge of depletion. Deple actually, deple depletion already started, and the idea is that if we will manage to construct this pipeline that will reach the East Mediterranean to Central Europe, then uh, the East Mediterranean will be the replacement of the Northern Sea. Uh, we will be able to replace what is missing in the supply from the Northern Sea. Of course, the United States itself is supplying some of the gas with LNG, but Europe is big, the consumption is enormous, and since uh, despite the coronavirus crisis, it will be over in a few months, in one year time, it's clear that in the next uh, 20 or 30 years, Europe will consume at least the same amount, maybe even more, uh, of natural gas, and here we can uh, collaborate together in order to bring natural gas to Europe and uh, to be benefited economically. Israel and Cyprus, from, because of their resources, this maybe also, hopefully, will find some gas in the Mediterranean, but even as a transition country, as a country that uh, get the gas uh, and distribute it for the rest of Europe, uh, this can be very beneficial to Greece as well. So this is, of course, the main focus. Uh, but we have other uh, ideas of cooperating, like, for example, the electricity interconnected uh, that uh, we already discussed it in the past, Greece side to side with Israel, that will uh, enable Israel and Cyprus and also the island of Crete to be uh, uh, electricity connected to mainland Europe. This is uh, also, in my view, is very important. Last but not least, it always goes to have the United States on board. It's always helpful, and I'm very glad that this regional cooperation is so uh, uh, significantly supported by, by, by the United States, by the Chamber of Commerce, by, by the Energy, by the Secretary of the Energy, and by the Secretary of State from the United States. Thanks. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, very well. Okay, excellent. Uh, Minister Hatzidakis, may I turn to you and uh, ask you how you see this uh, a trilateral partnership fitting into the wider strategy of Greece in, on energy? Uh, can, uh, and uh, since he mentioned the aspiration of turning the East Med into a new Black Sea, uh, how, do you, uh, how, how do you see uh, this developing in the current uh, environment and looking forward? First of all, congratulations to the Greek-American Chamber of Commerce and to the Atlantic Council for taking today's initiative. I'm glad to participate in an interesting, I believe, uh, dialogue uh, among those participating. Uh, and uh, I would like 
to say uh, from uh, clearly that uh, despite the obstacles uh, we have to overcome due to the coronavirus crisis, I believe that uh, all three countries, um, Israel, Cyprus and Greece, but also the United States, of course, will overcome uh, these, these obstacles uh, and uh, will proceed uh, in a better era for all our, our citizens. Uh, the energy component uh, is certainly at the core of our partnership uh, among the, three, the three, three countries, Greece, Israel and Cyprus, a partnership that dates back to 2011-2012 and uh, I believe, I mean, this is more than clear that this partnership is centered on two flagship project, uh, projects related to the electricity and gas interconnectivity. I refer obviously to the EuroAsia interconnector whose inclusion in the future PCI projects of common interest uh, list of the European Union we continue to support. And I also refer to uh, the most well-known uh, project, the East Med gas pipeline, whose intergovernmental agreement we signed uh, on January the 2nd here in Athens the three ministers participating in today's event. Uh, with regard to the East Med gas pipeline, I would like to inform everybody watching this teleconference that the Greek parliament ratified uh, with an overwhelming majority, uh, I would like to, to underline this agreement a few weeks ago. Uh, as far as I know, the Cypriot cabinet also gave its approval and I'm sure that after the reappointment of Minister Steinitz, our friend, and his, his team in the Energy Ministry of Israel, the ratification process will be completed uh, in Israel as well very soon. Uh, I would like to focus on the environmental aspect of our cooperation, uh, which is not so visible up to now, but I think that we have to examine this dimension as well, because uh, climate change is present, uh, we have to, re to react uh, to take all the necessary measures, but also uh, this uh, agenda, uh, the, the, the uh, green agenda, is uh, at the, one of the basic pillars of the policies of the European Union. Uh, and it, it has become evident uh, in the recent annou announcements of the European Commission uh, concerning the recovery fund. So, having said that, uh, I believe that uh, we have common uh, interest in promoting now transition towards a lower greenhouse uh, gas emissions uh, energy mix. And I believe, of course, that this cooperation, the trilateral cooperation, can be extended to cover other sectors like biofuels, electric uh, vehicles, electricity storage, energy efficiency, and renewable electricity. This is uh, the future. Uh, we don't forget, of course, uh, the natural gas, uh, uh, this, this will uh, remain important in the coming years. Uh, it will be the transit fuel, certainly, certainly, 
That's why we fully support the East Med uh, gas pipeline. But I think that uh, we have to examine this new dimension in our cooperation, the green energy dimension. Thank you. Uh, Minister Lekutripis, uh, um, your Greek colleague referred to the, the two flagship projects, uh, the East Med uh, gas pipeline and the Eurasia interconnected, but also looking forward in the future, the green cooperation. How do you see the trilateral partnerships from Cyprus and how does it fit in, what is the most important aspect of, of it for you? Um, Thank you very much, Katerina. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Uh, let me also start by thanking the Greek um, uh, arm cham for uh, putting this uh, together, together with the Cypriot and the Israeli uh, chambers and also the Atlantic Council. Uh, it is a great opportunity to discuss these important matters, uh, even uh, during a, a period where we cannot meet in person, which, of course, I certainly will be able to do so uh, very soon. Uh, certainly, uh, what I would describe beyond what my colleagues have just mentioned, what I would describe the trilateral partnership between, uh, between Israel, Greece and Cyprus would be a model of uh, countries sorry. working together I'm in the region. Now, sorry. And if you, if, you, if you recall and look back at the history of how it all started, you could see that uh, the, the trilateral partnership between uh, Greece Cyprus and Israel is the one which uh, laid the foundation for all the other partnerships that we are seeing in the region, be it uh, other trilateral uh, formations or even in the case of multilateral partnerships, such as more recently the East Met Gas Forum. And its, its fundamental basis is laid on, on the fact that here you have, uh, as Katerina put it in her introduction, three countries with common values, democratic values, uh, open countries, right? Who have now uh, uh, who have been sharing uh, a common vision, especially since the discoveries in Tamar in 2009, which created, of course, a new impetus in the Eastern Mediterranean and its potential for for gas. So several years down the line, we have plenty of discoveries, both in uh, in Israel, in Cyprus, in Egypt. We hope uh, soon soon Greece. But the, the mere fact is that the, this partnership and more recently the addition of, of the U.S. as well, which I am sure we'll be discussing uh, later on, uh, has, has given us the platform where we can discuss common issues, common challenges, common solutions. Right? My colleagues mentioned the EastMed pipeline, of course, the EuroAsia Interconnector for Electricity, which they are both backed up by uh, the European Union very strongly, but also by the U.S., Hopefully, and I totally agree with Kostis uh, about the transition towards a renewables future, despite the fact that we we feel strongly about gas being a bridge fuel towards towards that end. Uh, and, and certainly, I'll, I'll also offer another dimension. The fact that we have this kind of relationship between the three countries, plus the support of the US, gives them a very strong uh, confidence to companies to come and operate in the region and, and spend the millions and sometimes billions of dollars required either in the exploration phase or later in the exploitation phase. It gives them the confidence that, that countries can come together and, and, and sign agreements such as the uh, East Met uh, Intergovernmental Agreement that was signed in, in Athens on January 2nd. And yes, Kostis is right, we... We approved it at the Council of Ministers and it would be going into Parliament very soon uh, for ratification. So uh, it allows uh, companies to come in the region with confidence, knowing that the relationship between the countries is at the best level it can be. And uh, my relationship with Yuvalo, my relationship with, uh, with Costis is only a phone call away. So with that, thank you. And to welcome as well, as I see him on our screen, uh, 
uh, Assistant Secretary Francis Fano from the Bureau of Energy Resources of the State Department. Uh, so I, 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 I was uh, turning to Ambassador Payet, can we please bring him back to, to ask him, uh, you have attributed the excellent state of U.S. relations with Greece during your tenure uh, to an alignment of interests. And uh, it's both the U.S. and Greek strategy to boost trilateral cooperation in the region. How, what do you see the benefits of such an approach for Greece generally and more specifically on the energy sector? Thanks, Katerina. Well, let me start, first of all, by congratulating both the Atlantic Council and AmCham for this event. And in the same way, as Ben said, um, the Atlantic Council has made a big bet on Greece. The United States has made a big bet on the three plus one framework as a means to build stability and prosperity in a strategically dynamic region. Um, we can see the challenge of great power rivalry returning to the region, even during this coronavirus period. Um, I would just say a couple of quick points. I, Minister Hatsidakis spoke well to the benefits for Greece from this trilateral cooperation. For the United States, um, first of all, I, I should highlight that energy has been one of the real bright spots of our bilateral relationship for a few years now. We see Greece emerging as a major source of energy security across southeastern Europe with a whole variety of projects from the expanded Revathusa terminal to the TAP pipeline to the IGB pipeline now moving ahead to the floating regasification unit in Alexandropoli. So our work together with Greece, Israel, and Cyprus brings together three democracies, three countries that enjoy a strong dynamic relationship with the United States for us to work together on. That was Secretary Pompeo's message um, when he went to Jerusalem last spring to, to launch the three plus one process with all three leaders. But it's, it's not a coincidence, I think, that the, the first area to really deliver value in terms of that cooperation is energy. Um, I'm sure Assistant Secretary Fannin will have more to say about this. It's great to see the three ministers. And of course, we had Frank in, uh, in Athens in August for the first subgroup of the, the three plus one, which was our energy ministerial hosted by Minister Hatsidakis. We were very excited to do that. That was really one of the first foreign policy initiatives of the new government when it was elected in July. And, and I think it reflects how all of us are committed to continuing to work on these issues. I would just say to finish up, as we look to the future, um, we are going to continue to invest in this three plus one relationship. Uh, I'll, Frank will speak to what we're going to do on energy, but we see a lot of other areas where we can cooperate, including all of the work that's going to have to be done, both to deal with the consequences of the COVID pandemic and also to help stimulate growth across this wider region. And as you know, one of the bright spots for U.S.-Greece cooperation amid the difficulty of the pandemic has been what's been happening on technology and technology investment, where there have some big, been some big investments um, by American giants like Applied Materials and Microsoft, even during the pandemic. So we see technology cooperation as a natural area of synergy between the three governments um, of the three and the United States. But we will, we will also continue to work on the big strategic issues including questions like how we stabilize the situation um, in, the, uh, in the North Africa region um, and how we work together to continue to advance our shared interest in European energy security. So we've got a lot to do, and I'm grateful for the, the effort that AmCham and, and the Atlantic Council are making to help inform those policy decisions. Thank you, Ambassador. So, Secretary Fanon, if I may turn to you, please uh, give us a uh, bigger layout of the U.S. strategy in the region and uh, how you see this developing, also taking into account the uh, current market turbulence because of COVID-19. Uh, uh, you've been a supporter of Greece joining, the U.S. has been of, the US, uh, of Greece joining the three season initiatives. Do you still see value on that? Do you still see value on like, continuing exploration in the Eastern Mediterranean? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Katerina and uh, ministers. Uh, Jeff, it's so good to see, uh, see all of you. Uh, we would much prefer to do these kind of things in person, uh, but here we are. Um, uh, I, I, I guess you know Jeff spoke uh, about the, the construct of the three plus one and Secretary Pompeo's uh, launching that uh, with the respective uh, heads of state, and I was I was honored to to be with him in the, in that. Um, you know the State Department 
focuses with respect to energy, it's really where uh, the, where energy is a, is a proxy for broader foreign policy issues, uh, which is why the State Department, why Secretary Pompeo has has from the U.S. side has, has been so engaged on this issue. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, the three plus one construct is is certainly broader than than just energy, but but we see in the in the Eastern Mediterranean region, energy uh, is such a, 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 an ability has an ability to to bring states together uh, to have practical outcomes. It creates uh, this uh, the, the really the evolution of a market where none existed before. Now, of course, U.S. companies uh, were on the the, the, the ground level of helping to facilitate this this new uh, and continue to be. Uh, this new energy resource in the region. Uh, and so our view is where energy can serve as a broader bridge to provide resilience uh, and create uh, the, the, the appropriate uh, measures to support political, broader political stability. So it's in that context that we approach uh, energy. Um, you know, Minister Hatsataka spoke, I saw a reference to the importance of environment and in environmental quality issues. Um, we, we also, in the energy pillar, we have sub work groups where we're looking at the specific elements to, to help with, uh, uh, with some of these issues of, of, of common interest of all the states in the region. And one of those we kicked off and, and, and uh, Minister Lakachupas uh, helped uh, host the, the first of these technical work groups with all the countries present was focused on environmental quality and the performance of, of the offshore development of, of the region. It's everyone's interest that this is be done, to be done safely and at the highest levels. Renewables will be another component. Cyber security issues will be another component of these sub workers. So the product is, is, is a meaningful forum, but it's not just an area where we get together and have discussions. Things get very specific and have actionable outcomes. You know the, the the point about the market as it as it all. Well, I think that yes, COVID has created an unprecedented economic. You know, the global economy is on shared ter territory here, and the energy in industry and the energy markets uh, perhaps even chaotic uh, territory. But we will the clouds of COVID will disperse, and we will get back to doing business. Uh, uh, in natural gas. Uh, is a, you know, I heard someone refer to it as a bridge fuel. We look at it in the context of, it, it, it's the, it's, it is the, the, the optimal fuel source to integrate with existing and new technologies uh, because it can, it can be, it, it can be uh, addressed the intermittency. And so we look at this evolution of, of holistic energy systems of which the Eastern Mediterranean gas, U.S. gas uh, will create that that foundation. Uh, so we're excited about the developments. Uh, and I still think the other outcomes of the COVID experience will be underscoring the criticality of having supply, secure and resilient supply chains for everything, including energy. And uh, the three countries uh, participating in the, in the trilat, we of course are the plus one, uh, as, as was already stated, built on strong shared values, democratic principles, uh, and focused on transparency uh, and efficient market design. And that is a leading uh, component of how we view our engagement in the region and around the world. Uh, thank you. And if we may bring into the discussion Ambassador Morningstar, uh, I remember your lecture in Piraeus University last year when you mentioned that energy security translates to economic and political security. And this is certainly the aspiration in the East made with the trilateral cooperation, no less. Uh, I'm wondering, how do you see the current market pressures, but also the geopolitical tensions in the region affecting this aspiration? Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Katerina. It is good to be uh, with all of you. Uh, a lot of good friends on the screen right now. Uh, Frank, I'm happy to see, or not, I don't know if I'm happy to see, but in the last five days, you've shaved your beard uh, okay. since the last time, since the last time we were on a, uh, we were on a panel together. 
Uh, your point, uh, Katrina, I think is really important that uh, we have to recognize that energy security relates directly to economic security as well as political security and stability. And Eastern Mediterranean resources are critical uh, to, uh, to those points and to those efforts, both within the region and with respect to Europe, which I think is uh, very important uh, for us to remember. I was also glad to hear, happy to hear all of the participants talking about the whole litany of projects that, that relate to the Eastern Mediterranean, all of which are important. Um, let me though focus for a few minutes, a couple of minutes on what was, I guess, one of the prime purposes of, the, uh, of this panel to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, Israel-Cyprus-Greece pipeline. And the way I see that from a reality standpoint is there's some not so good news, but there are also reasons to be optimistic. Uh, the uh, pandemic is obviously uh, right now, anyway, the elephant in the room. There are delays in projects all over the world as a result of the drop in demand, uh, the drop in prices. And it's hard to believe that companies would be willing to start a project, at least right now. Uh, but there, uh, but there, uh, there are reasons to be uh, optimistic. First of all, uh, <clears throat> I noted that uh, my friend Minister Lakatripas in the last uh, few days talked about, hey, remember, there's no final investment decision uh, on this project uh, until 2022. So let's do the work uh, to prepare for that date now. And there's no reason why that can't take place. And one of the criticisms of the project has been, I've heard from companies that from a commercial standpoint, it may not make sense. And what make, may make the most sense is gas going to Egypt and then coming back uh, to uh, countries like Greece, Cyprus, whatever, uh, Europe uh, in, the form, in the form of LNG. We'll see. But there are ways, I think, to deal with that. And that has to be one of the prime things that's worked on uh, over the next few years. I think that US and EU involvement uh, will be absolutely critical. The Eastern Mediterranean Act, Frank pointed out, is, is very, very important. But it may be that forms of government financing can help push a project like that across the goal line uh, from Europe, but also there are new opportunities from the United States. With the monies that are now available uh, for projects relating to European energy stability through, uh, uh, through the Development Finance Corporation, there's now something like a billion dollars that's potentially available uh, for investment. And that's not necessarily just direct investment. It can be also in the form of project finance guarantees, which allows that billion dollars to be stretched well beyond well beyond that amount. So th those are issues I think that really ought to be looked at in, in connection with that project. As far as the overall geopolitical standpoint, from that standpoint that uh, you asked about Katerina, you know, I think, uh, you know, there are the obvious political obstacles. And I think that the United States and the EU have to work together to bring the parties together. Uh, you know, uh, Turkey hasn't been mentioned during during this discussion, but hey, Turkey is there, and it seems to me that every effort that the that the U.S. and the EU, uh, working with its partners uh, in the region, have to have to work towards some kind of reconciliation. I had always hoped, and looking at it from maybe more from an energy standpoint, that there could be some uh, uh, some agreement between. Uh, 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 Cyprus and the northern uh, and the northern sector, uh, with respect to how to how to share uh, energy the energy benefits. Uh, whether that comes first or an overall agreement comes first, you know, we'll see. But we need to all work together to eliminate the political obstacles uh, within uh, within the within the region. I've often said there. Are, there have never been so many opportunities with so many obstacles, and we have to work together to remove those obstacles. 
Thank you, Ambassador. And um, you've uh, mentioned two points. And uh, Turkey is certainly in the minds of our, the watchers of uh, our webinar today. And uh, it's also uh, on my mind. And I'm going to ask about it. But first, I would like to give the opportunity to Dr. Steinitz to respond to uh, and uh, to the um, um, estimate that the East, as he mentioned earlier, that uh, the East Med gas pipeline is uh, still the best uh, uh, way to transport this gas. And I, I would like to ask you more specifically, uh, as uh, a lot of analysts actually are, uh, are wondering whether the, the window of opportunity for this project to make commercial sense is closing because of the developments of the last uh, uh, few months. Thank you, Katerina. I will refer to this uh, topic, but I would like also to refer to two other topics that were raised by the, uh, my colleagues and the other participants. So first, uh, with regard to the EastMed, uh, uh, to, to the uh, 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 cross-Mediterranean uh, gas pipeline, or EastMed, as, we, as many people uh, named it, uh, of course, uh, now it's a difficult time. Uh, gas prices, oil prices, energy prices went down uh, during the following the corona um, um, the coronavirus crisis, and actually it started uh, even a little bit before. But when we are speaking about such projects in the energy sector, uh, in the gas sector, we don't speak about uh, the current situation because, as was mentioned already just to, to, to get a final investment decision, it will take another year or two. And then to construct the pipeline, it will take another between uh, approximately four or five years. So, uh, and uh, the return on such investment will take uh, almost a decade. So uh, we are speaking here, we have to look forward for between 20 to 30 years, at least 20 years, and prices are going up and down, the uh, prices of gas, but the demand is there. The demand in Europe is huge. And I'm confident that uh, this project is uh, will be viable. Of course, there are some times that uh, uh, facts are, 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 are changing. Look, you have some pipes going to Europe from uh, Siberia and also across the Caspian you see, and from Azerbaijan through Turkey and through the the uh, Aegean Sea, and uh, I think that the East Med is should be a very promising project, not just because of the amount of gas of of of, of the uh, from the producers and from the uh, market from the demand, but also because Europe can uh, rely on Israel and Cyprus, and on the East Med gas pipeline, maybe even more than on other uh, uh, way of supply. Uh, first, because uh, we are speaking on uh, democracies. Israel, Cyprus, and Greece are all three uh, Western-style democracies, uh, very stable countries uh, that can be trusted. All are members of the OECD. And therefore, uh, to have such a supply uh, from uh, such stable democracies is always, I think, also from European point of view, this is there is some advantage here. Secondly, such an undersea, a deep undersea pipeline will be maybe the most secure pipeline in the world. Nobody can reach it two kilometers below sea level. Nobody can sabotage it. No terrorist, no country. Uh, maybe only a superpower uh, can can locate the pipe and do something against it. But this will be also a difficult mission even to a superpower. So the pipeline will be very secure. Uh, Israel and Cyprus as a source and Greece and hopefully Italy. Italy actually wasn't bored and we, uh, I bored and we have to bring it back uh, on board of this project. And I believe that this is possible. This uh, will become possible soon. Uh, this, this is the most secure uh, pipeline supply not LNG, but pipeline supply of gas that Europe can dream of. And in all my talks with the European uh, previous energy commissioner, Mr. Kanyeta, uh, he mentioned that uh, 
they are vehemently supportive of this project, not just because the amount of gas, but because of the, not just the value of gas, but also the value of the countries involved, yeah, the, the democratic values and uh, 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 the security. So I'm confident that this project should take place, not without difficulties, of course, we will have to overcome some difficulties. We already overcome many difficulties, but uh, this is not a dream. This can become a reality, depend on us. Uh, speaking about energy, secur energy security that was mentioned already here, uh, also during the, or in, uh, in light of the coronavirus crisis, I want to mention another dimension, and this is, of course, cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is a very crucial element of energy security. You know, there were many reports and rumors about things that were going on in Israel and in the Middle East. Recently, I won't comment on those uh, reports, but I can say that it's re-emphasized the importance of cybersecurity. Here in Israel, we have built the first of its kind uh, cybersecurity headquarter and center only for the energy sector. I mean, we have, of course, the nation, the, the country, a cybersecurity cert, which is very good, but we already established three years ago a special uh, headquarter only for the energy sector in Israel to defend our uh, the energy sector, our gas platforms, pipelines, uh, power stations, uh, substations, the electricity grid, um, uh, refineries and so on and so forth, because we believe that this needs a special expertise and a special kind of defense. And uh, uh, probably you won't be surprised, Katerina, if the only uh, leaders from abroad that were invited to visit this uh, a unique cybersecurity center in Be'er Sheva for the energy sector where the leaders of the countries are uh, participating in this uh, uh, a, a meeting. Uh, a president, uh, a, a, the, the president and prime ministers of Greece and Cyprus and the two uh, energy um, uh, secretaries of the United States already visited as well, Secretary Rick Perry, former Secretary Rick Perry and uh, Secretary uh, uh, Dan Borlet, he visited all, still when he was a uh, 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 deputy uh, secretary for the energy. And of course, we are ready to share. I just, uh, one week ago, I spoke uh, with uh, the American Secretary of State, Dan Borlet, and on the need to accelerate our cybersecurity cooperation to do with the energy sector, specifically with the energy sector. And uh, we will do it with the United States and of course with my two colleagues from uh, with, with, with Greece and Cyprus. Speaking about energy security, this is an important factor and it's going to be more and more crucial than before to have a very sophisticated, uh, 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 elaborated, uh, uh, cyber uh, defense. I want to touch another uh, issue that was touched by our Greek uh, colleague, by uh, Kostis, Hajidakis, previously about the gas as a transition fuel or transition source of energy uh, 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 because in the future it should be only renewables and green. Uh, and I want to Tell you that just yesterday I announced my plans to the since we have a new government and I became again the Minister of uh, Energy. Yesterday I announced some uh, the, the, some plans for the a new uh, term and for, for, for the next 10 years. And uh, what I mainly focused on is that uh, I, I, I have, uh, presented the plans to uh, make Israel in, in 1930, 10 years from now, uh, the energy mix will be 70% natural gas and 30% solar energy. This will be the mix in order to get 
30% solar energy, actually we have to, pro to produce about 100% of our electricity from the sun uh, uh, in the afternoon. If we will manage to, to be able to produce 100% of electricity, uh, this will amount to 30% around, uh, around the year, around, around all, all hours. This demand a huge investment. We are going to invest uh, about uh, $20 billion, it's quite a lot to such a little country, in uh, solar systems and energy storage in order to enable it in 10 years. This will make Israel a leader in solar energy. The European Union is going to be on 9%. We are going to be on 30% in 10 years from now. But still, even after 2030, if there will be no major, major uh, breakthroughs in energy storage, if there will be some improvement, but generally speaking, it will be like today, we won't be able to, since in our case, it's only solar. We don't have, um, we have very little wind and no, no hydroelectrics or other means. Uh, we will be relying on uh, natural gas also beyond uh, 1930 and 1940. And uh, this will still enable us to reduce pollution from the energy sector by 94 percent. I mean, if I compare to 1950, when I was first appointed Minister of Energy, to 1930, in those 15 years, we will go down by 94 or 95 percent in air pollution in Israel and more than 50 percent in, uh, in CO2 emission, in carbon emission per capita. This is significant. You, we, we will do it with natural gas with natural gas and solar system, not just with nuclear. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I, I'm noting the news here, but also I'm noting the time and I want to have uh, an opportunity, I'm conscious of everyone's time and I want to have the opportunity to talk a little bit uh, about uh, Turkey as well as it was already mentioned. Uh, let me first uh, turn to Secretary Fano and then uh, ask him, uh, uh, you, you in the United States, uh, you have expressed your concern about Turkey's activities uh, in cyber CZZ, and uh, but I wanted to also ask you what is your reaction to the official publication in Turkey of Turkey's petroleum application for exploration permits in areas that actually touch upon the Greek continental self? Yeah, thank thank you. Um, our our position remains consistent. Uh, first, as I, I go back to my earlier comments, how we the United States views the region as as one that should be open, rule of law respected, and allow for an opportunity for, in the context of energy, uh, for there to be transparent, efficient markets so that energy can be developed, and moved, transported, and consumed uh, to all who need it. Uh, so, in terms of the specific issue uh, of this MOU, I mean, firstly, we, we, we also have been very consistent in, in calling to stop all provocative actions that could undermine the investment confidence that we've spoken about earlier, and also could undermine and affect political stability in the region. Um, we, we don't comment as a matter of course on on countries maritime boundaries um, but I would I would recognize that an MOU cannot as a legal matter uh, affect the rights of or obligations of of third states such as Greece um, the international international law the, the convention on the law of the sea uh, generally recognizes that islands uh, uh, they affect the rights and obligations. Uh, well, islands generally have an AEZ and they have a continental shelf, uh, just as any other land territory. Um, and we, you know, we're not, we can't comment on future actions of what, what may or may not happen. We've certainly read, read reporting. 
Uh, and again, we just encourage uh, that, that states stop provocative action, stop provocative behavior, uh, and stop provocative statements, uh, and really look at the opportunities that's, a, that's before them. And we want, uh, and the U.S. will continue to be a constructive part uh, in that, in the development of the region. This is met cooperation is not uh, against Turkey, but also noting that Turkey needs to come to the table in respect of international law. How do you view the latest, uh, um, the latest move from Turkey? Is it like an, a, 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 some climax uh, that uh, um, it concerns you greatly? Do you see a change in the, um, the climax that uh, Turkey is making in the region? Yeah, the, the, the statements. I mean, like I said, the, the, an MOU doesn't abrogate the rights of states uh, of third of party states. I mean, they're they're they're, they're recognized. Their 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 legal status is recognized. Um, there's not an equivalency here. Um, I, I you know I was in I, I traveled actually to to both Istanbul and Ankara to have some discussions. I mean, Turkey it's an important it's an important country. Uh, we, we want to continue to have Turkey uh, looking westward and being a constructive, play a constructive role uh, in the international community more broadly uh, in Europe and in that in the Eastern Mediterranean region. Uh, so we'll continue those, uh, those engagements uh, and, uh, and, and, and continue to encourage that parties come with uh, a constructive element Provocative actions, provocative statements, just undermines confidence, uh, and uh, and it doesn't even advance their own agenda. So uh, let's 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 be constructive here. And I'll, I'm happy to go back to Ankara if that would be welcome. Minister Hatzidakis, if I may have your take, please. Yeah, uh, the the Greek government uh, has a decisive stance towards Turkey without being provocative. Uh, we are a modern European state and this is our political behavior towards Turkey. But as you know, it takes two to tango. Uh, we will continue having the same approach and we hope that on the other side of the Aegean, uh, a new spirit will prevail. Uh, to be more specific as regards our position, I would like to refer to the two, two recent examples. One concerning today's discussion. Uh, one month before the signature ceremony here in Athens concerning the East Med gas pipeline, you all know that Mr. Erdogan uh, made a provocative statement saying more or less that the three countries do not have the right to uh, proceed to the signature. Uh, we signed the intergovernmental agreement because we believe that uh, this uh, pipeline, the East Med pipeline, uh, is not against the interest of any other country, uh, East Med uh, gas pipeline serves the interest of all three countries involved, and it is a project of cooperation and peace. And this is a message Turkey uh, must understand. Another example is the stance, the position of the, Europe, the, the Greek government in the, the, the river Evros, when uh, thousands of immigrants uh, uh, tried to invade the Greek uh, borders, encouraged in practice by the Turkish government. We defended our, uh, our borders, and uh, what uh, we have done uh, is, in our view, self-evident. This is our position. Uh, we, 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 we are working to enhance our relations with our neighbors, because we believe that uh, 
only through peace uh, both Greece and Turkey can prosper. But on the other hand, we have our national uh, sovereignty and our national pride. And we have, as I said, to defend the interests of our uh, country. And th this is clear. Uh, Minister Lakotripis, if I may turn to you for a chance to also respond to this question, as uh, Cyprus has also seen uh, illegal drilling and it's easy and uh, it has complicated your strategy in exploration uh, on the island for your take. Thank you, Thank you Katerina. Uh, indeed, um, uh, this is uh, not something new and this behaviour by tech is not something new from uh, for Cyprus, it's been going on for a while, and as a matter of fact, as we are speaking, uh, Turkey is attempting a, sex, a sixth uh, drill inside Cyprus's exclusive economic zone. And, and I would like to remind everyone at this point that on, on repeated occasions, uh, the Cyprus government, the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, uh, of, of, the Cyprus, of Cyprus, has invited Turkey to uh, the table to delineate just like it's it's common uh, with with all neighbors, right? So so any argument to say that all of these trilaterals or multilateral uh, formations are going against uh, Turkey, allow me to say it's uh, it's absolutely rubbish. Uh, so so Cyprus has invited Turkey to either come to the negotiating table and negotiate, or indeed uh, go to the International Court of Justice to resolve our differences, because. Uh, Cyprus feels very confident about its legal case, and, and Frank uh, mentioned its, its basis a little bit earlier, which is, of course, the United Nations law for the Convention of the Sea, Article 121, right, which determines uh, what is the regime of violence with regards to exclusive economic zone. And, uh, and I've heard a lot of Turkish officials talk about uh, that they are going about with international law and that they're respecting it. Well, I, it would be nice if they can give us what article are they referring to, what kind of, of, of agreement are they talking about. We are referring to, among others, uh, UNCLOS Article 121, which is uh, one of the most impart important ones. And of course, the counter argument with Turkey and anyone will tell you they have not ratified uh, UNCLOS. But so did the United States. The United States has not ratified UNCLOS, but respects it fully, right? And and not not to mention that it has become now customary customary law. Uh, I heard uh, Ambassador Morningstar earlier uh, talk about um, the how do we share the resources uh, on the island, and 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 our response to that is pretty pretty clear and pretty firm. There are a lot of other issues that need to be resolved first before before we go down that, down that route. First and foremost, there's not going to be any, any revenue from hydrocarbons for a few years down the road, right? And, and two, the, the Cyprus parliament has enacted into law a proposal by government to create a sovereign wealth fund where no one, no one can touch any revenues from hydrocarbons for, uh, for, uh, for any, any foreseeable future. It will all be safe for future generations. Which, mind you, should include, includes also the Turkish Cypriots. So there is, there is no excuse to say, how do we share resources? On the contrary, uh, we say, let's focus on resolving the Cyprus problem. Let's focus on, on resolving the, on, on having a delineation agreement with Turkey. Because at the end of the day, um, uh, Katerina, what what kind of seas are we talking about? What kind of resources? What kind of uh, revenues are we talking about? Are we talking about the EZ, which Turkey claims on its own and, and basically reduces Cyprus's EZ by, by 69%? Or are we talking about the internationally recognized exclusive economic zone, uh, which uh, we have allocated uh, also blocks and we're doing exploration and to international uh, companies through international uh, tenders. So the the question of Turkey is uh, is uh, coming over and over and over again. Uh, I, I made earlier the comparison uh, with the U.S. and allow me to say that the fundamental difference is that the U.S. is a, a true democratic power, confident about itself and its role in the world, and this is why uh, we are very glad to uh, participate in the in the three plus one uh, uh, 
activities which are which are are being planned. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm uh, conscious of your time. Uh, this conversation should be should uh, could continue for a long time. Still, I, I just want to give an opportunity for anyone who wants to make a comment before we close, uh, because we need to be aware of the second panel that is already waiting for our uh, um, for the next session. Yes, Minister. Has that um, I'm extremely glad that uh, the Greek-American relations have been strengthened uh, and the Greek government is going to, to work towards um, enhancing uh, further uh, these uh, relations. Uh, I'm also glad that the U.S. Uh, is supporting, uh, uh, firmly uh, supports uh, very important energy projects uh, in uh, in Greece, like IGB, the Greece-Bulgarian interconnector, the FSRU uh, project uh, in uh, Alexandropolis, uh, strongly supported also by, by the Greek uh, government, and I'm sure that the US uh, is supporting this common project, the uh, East Med Gas Pipeline, um, common project of uh, Israel, Cyprus, and Greece. And I would like also to say that uh, given the good uh, personal uh, relations among uh, Yuval, uh, George, uh, and me, uh, all three of us, uh, are going to uh, continue cooperating in other fields as well. And I look forward to uh, organizing the 3 plus 1 meeting uh, with Mr. Fanon very soon, uh, either virtually or uh, as we uh, had our previous meeting here in, in Athens last August. Thank you, Katerina. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. I'm keeping this uh, commitment and I'm also keeping the offer for another visit to Ankara from uh, uh, Mr. Fanon. Katerina, can I just, just to make a quick point before Certainly. we Certainly. Just to note, uh, first of all, obviously endorsing completely Minister Hatsidakis' strong statement on the status of U.S.-Greece relations. But I would also emphasize how it, important it is that the whole of the U.S. government is now looking at the Eastern Mediterranean systematically and through the lens of this three plus one construct. Frank and the ENR Bureau have been a big part of this, but it's really a whole of government effort. And I should also single out the leadership of Senator Menendez and Senator Rubio in pushing ahead the East Med Act, which writes the administration's policy into congressional law. So we really, I think we have built a new construct here, and I think it's terrific that AmCham and, and Atlantic Council are helping to reinforce that. So thank you. It's great to end uh, on that note, Ambassador. Thank you all very much. Yes, Dr. Stein. Yeah, I just want to thank you and to thank my colleagues. Uh, the, this partnership is extremely important for us and for the region. Actually, I want to tell you that since a new government was constructed in Israel, established in Israel just two weeks ago. I insisted on on, on a, a remain a energy minister and not taking other uh, uh, maybe uh, portfolios to do with education, with higher education and things like that. And one of my uh, um, the, the reason I have done so was, and I told also the prime minister that I am so uh, glad and so. Uh, uh, happy about this regional relations and cooperation um, in general in the region, but also specifically with my colleagues from Greece and uh, Cyprus. I told the Prime Minister it's important for me to proceed in order to keep this uh, spirit of cooperation among us. I want also to mention that I have had the privilege to join the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Netanyahu, for uh, almost four hours meeting with Secretary Pompeo just uh, 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 two weeks ago when he arrived to Israel. Actually, it was the only uh, international visit in Israel uh, for, for, I think, two months following the coronavirus. Of course, uh, it was an extremely important visit. We discussed everything. 
I'm unable to elaborate, but I think again that this uh, partnership here in the region with the backing and support and involvement of the United States, this is crucial for regional security and prosperity. So I want to thank my dear colleagues, uh, Costis and uh, George, and also all the American uh, uh, participants. Thank you very much. Thank you for participating, gentlemen. Thank you. Hopefully Thank we will be able to meet really to, together uh, as soon as possible. Uh, we'll take a short break and we'll be right uh, right back in uh, a couple of minutes until uh, so that the next panel can come into uh, our screens. Thank you.
Hello, uh, I think we're live again. And uh, may, please excuse uh, our sort of because of the ministerial panel. And uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to take the discussion to the business sector and the opportunities that are created for uh, businesses of the region because of the trilateral partnership or uh, in the context of it. And uh, I would like to welcome the Noble Energy Director for Israel, Mr. Bini Zomer, uh, from uh, the DEPA, uh, uh, Mr. Dimitris Manolis, the Head of International Projects and Deputy Development Director for IGI Poseidon, which has a role, of course, in the Smed Gas Pipeline. <laughs> and also the CEO of Energian, and company with uh, uh, a big presence throughout the Eastern Mediterranean, Mr. Matthias Rivas, and also from SIGAS in Cyprus, Mr. Simeon Kasianidis, the chairman and CEO. So gentlemen, if I, if I may start uh, with asking uh, your perspective on the opportunities that uh, the closer cooperation and partnership between Greece, Cyprus, and Israel had, has created for your companies in the region to the extent that it has, and how you see it moving forward, where you would like it to move next, and how it may facilitate with your work. And if I may start with uh, Mr. Vinny Dober, please. Uh, yes, uh, well, thank you, uh, Atlanta Council uh, and the American uh, Hellenic uh, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the AmCham in Cyprus, and uh, and especially uh, uh, the Israel America Chamber, uh, is where I sit on and uh, uh, do uh, great work here. So thank you all for for allowing us uh, this opportunity. Uh, I would uh, so th and thank you uh, for your question. Um, look, there's uh, as Noble Energy is is uh, really a company operating uh, not just in Israel but in Cyprus as well. Um, uh, in Egypt and in Jordan. Uh, I think this uh, regional cooperation of which uh, uh, really began uh, with these uh, three countries, but has uh, since expanded, has really provided uh, uh, the impetus for our uh, regional uh, opportunities here. I, I see that uh, as well, and I, I would be remiss if I also didn't mention uh, the US government and the, and the role that they play I think what we're doing here through the cooperation of these countries, uh, Israel, Cyprus, and Greece, uh, as well as uh, if you look more broadly, even the Eastern Med Gas Forum and the exports to Egypt and to uh, Jordan, uh, really uh, furthers uh, you have this this opportunity where where our commercial um, opportunities really uh, dovetail with uh, uh, U.S. and Western uh, interests in the region, and so. Uh, without that and the uh, dialogue, without these uh, cooperation between the countries, uh, that would not be, be happening. And so uh, we've seen a uh, really tremendous uh, opportunity here. Okay, and if I may take uh, this question to Mr. Manolis from uh, Depa to, um, for his perspective. Yeah. Good afternoon to all, and thank you very much for, for the kind invitation. Unfortunately, our CEO, Mr. Psefaras, who was not uh, due to an unforeseen uh, event, um, was is not able to attend this uh, this round table. So, uh, uh, allow me to, to start by mentioning the trilateral uh, agreement that uh, was signed in the 2nd of January of, of this year which we believe that sends a, a clear message of support for, for the EastMed project. Uh, we believe that the preparation and signing of this agreement uh, follows the completion of the pre-feed studies that were supported by the European Union and uh, confirmed that the EastMed project is uh, out of any doubt, technically feasible, economically viable and competitive and uh, complementary with any other alternative export option of, of gas uh, of the region. This agreement is not uh, just, uh, does not represent a symbolic value. It is uh, with a huge encouragement to, to the project promoter, the IGI Poseidon company, a joint venture between uh, uh, DEPA and Italian Edison, 
to go ahead with the next phase of the ISMED's uh, development. Uh, because the parties uh, will be supporting the promoters' efforts to achieve the, not only the funding, permitting and effective regulatory uh, system necessary for the further development of, of the project up to the final investment decision stage that we foresee that can happen in two to three years. So, um, we're extremely pleased that on, on the May 14th and on May the 28th, the Greek Parliament and the Cypriot uh, Government Cabinet respectively ratified the EastMed uh, Project uh, Intergovernmental Agreement. I should add that uh, on May the 5th, very recently, the Greek Parliament recognized the EastMed Poseidon projects as projects of national importance and of public interest for Greece. So, in other words, the Parliament recognized recognized the value uh, of uh, the project that will greatly help the region and promote Greece's role as a major energy trader in the South Mediterranean uh, region and, and the Balkans. Um, IJ Poseidon and uh, its shareholders acknowledge the need to implement a rapid approach and complete the activities of the Eastwood project in accordance uh, with the terms of the financial support agreement with the European Union, which is financing 50% of the total cost of this uh, development phase of the project, aiming to meet the conditions required for starting its construction in a period of two to three years. At the same time, uh, the company's efforts for the uh, active participation of our stakeholders in the development and implementation of the project were intensified. And uh, in this context, uh, we have uh, signed uh, agreements with uh, Energian uh, and uh, INGL and the Israeli uh, TSO and uh, TMNZ. Now, in the past uh, nine months, we have completed all the evaluations for all the international tenders that uh, were launched by the company and related to the studies uh, that the pipeline is now needing for reaching uh, FID in due time. So, in, in fact, now the, our company, Poseidon Company, has awarded very recently the detailed marine survey and uh, the feed contracts for the offshore sections, the onshore sections and the above ground installations to the facilities of the project. And meanwhile, it's, it's ready now to award the Asia studies for the uh, offshore and the onshore sections of the project. Uh, regarding uh, cooperation, as you all know, on, on January the 2nd, uh, DEPA, uh, in its commercial vest, has signed uh, a declaration uh, of intent with Energia, um, the first agreement for the commercial exploitation of the Eastman pipeline. With this agreement, we have taken a decisive step to ensure trade viability and consequently the implementation uh, of the project. So, DEPA has uh, been steadily expanding its commercial activities in cooperation with uh, international partners and continues to promote uh, infrastructure that guarantee the diversification of resources and energy security for both Greece and uh, Europe. And, by, and this is done by systematically strengthening its international presence. Our company is now in a position to exploit developments in the Eastern Mediterranean region. Very uh, Since uh, um, Mr. Manolo already mentioned the letter of intent that is signed, and obviously, you, uh, I believe in the course of this year, you will have presence in eight uh, countries in the Mediterranean. Uh, so I'm wondering how important is the trilateral partnership and uh, uh, one of its flagship projects, the Eastern Mediterranean gas pipeline, for uh, your uh, um, your work and your strategy in the region. Uh, well, thank you very much first for the invitation. Thank you for this wonderful event. And uh, I think we've discussed a lot and we heard a lot by the ministers about the pipeline and uh, the position that uh, Mr. Manolis made very clear is the progress that has been made in this great project. I think uh, things are very simple here. In order for this pipeline to become commercially viable, we need to have sufficient resources of gas on the supply side and a competitive gas price 
for the users uh, on the other end. So with the agreement that we've signed with TEPA, uh, it's an agreement for a supply of 2 BCM a year. I think that gives a very clear signal that there is enough gas on the supply side and there's also a competitive price to be landed on, uh, on the Greek grid or further on to, to Europe. So when we, uh, when we came into Israel, uh, gas prices were around about $6 uh, an MBTU. And uh, with the investment that we're making right now in the Karish Tanin project that we're developing, it's a $1.7 billion investment, which is ongoing at the moment. And the new gas that we have discovered in Karish North uh, we're sitting at the moment on about 100 BCM of proven gas in Israel. 65% of that is already committed to the Israeli market. The balance is available to serve the contract that, or the letter of intent we have with uh, DEPA and also the proposal that we made to supply gas to Cyprus. So gas is available. Gas price could be uh, very competitive, depending, of course, on the final price of the project. Uh, and the trilateral agreement is extremely important because that underpins uh, a project with three stable governments, as we heard before from uh, the ministers, underpinning a very important project for the security of supply of Europe. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are asking, why is it competitive when gas prices have collapsed in today's environment? Well, I fully agree with uh, Minister Steinitz and his position that these are not projects that we look at from what is happening today. These are long-term projects, and we have to take a long-term perspective that enhance the security of supply, the competition uh, in the countries that this pipeline will go through, and uh, will bring gas from the East Med into hopefully Cyprus and, uh, and the rest of Europe. So huge importance to have the government supporting, huge importance to have the European Union supporting financially this project, huge importance to have the US backing this very important project to bring the gas into Europe. I turn to Mr. Cassianidis to ask uh, uh, his take on uh, the East Med gas pipeline and especially how long, in, in regards to how long you expect as well that it may take for the halt of uh, uh, the Cyprus exploration or the gas development uh, to resume and uh, whether this affects at all the pipeline commercial feasibility. Please unmute your mic. Okay, thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving us the opportunity to present uh, Cyprus's plants in this uh, area. I think uh, on the whole, the, the play, I think it's generally recognized and I think it's accepted that uh, the development of the East Mediterranean hydrocarbons uh, industry is a regional play. And as such, let's say, uh, Cyprus and all its uh, constituents, let's say, including uh, DEFA and including which is Saigas, including ETIFA and so forth, all have a role to play and they're part of it. So with respect to the timing and the delays in terms of the East Med pipeline, it has been discussed again before and uh, before uh, with the ministers talking, uh, it was clearly stated that uh, uh, things take the time, our industry does take its time, it's known for its cyclic uh, behavior and changing of prices and so forth. Uh, any decision on the ISNET pipeline would be in two years time, so there's a lot of groundwork that needs to be done. And frankly, in terms of, uh, from a technical perspective, the two years period, let's say, uh, can only lead to maybe an improvement of the technical viability of the project because we will have with the drivers uh, of wanting to make it happen, uh, further technological development that will actually bring down the cost and thus make it more uh, viable. Uh, with respect to uh, Cyprus and its, uh, and its part uh, in it, I think Cyprus is, uh, unavoidably in the central location for this. Uh, Cyprus is looking very supportive in this uh, exercise. Uh, it is part of the ISCAS uh, forum. Uh, we have been, uh, we have joined as uh, SIGAS, the technical part of it in order to cooperate in this, in this uh, whole period. And we are following a very structured and uh, organized step-by-step uh, -step plan in order to 
uh, achieve first methanization of the country because uh, Cyprus right now still depends on liquid fuels and uh, after 10 years of efforts let's say we are very near now to be able to achieve that task and uh, we have uh, always been open to uh, when the time is right to explore different cooperations like uh, when we have discussed in the past uh, uh, actually in person with uh, uh, Matthias Rivers in my, in my office uh, but we actually have to follow certain timelines for this uh, to be achieved so I think uh, this period, uh, uh, the most important part will be to reach a stability for our industry, which is uh, still a little bit in terms of uncertainty. Uh, when stability happens, then uh, the regional cooperation uh, can provide, let's say, a lot of uh, possibilities uh, for growth. Already we have a lot of projects from the region that want to come and take advantage of uh, Cyprus's uh, a possibility, whether that is a, a for a supply, energy supply, energy security uh, for countries or for energy security, let's say regional, and as well, let's say we have uh, we, we have already worked together with DEPA uh, in a, a co-founded European uh, Union project that looks at the holistic uh, uh, use of natural gas uh, in Cyprus, and we are in discussions with them for other type of projects as well. Uh, the same kind of discussions we've had with counterparties in Israel as well. So I think, uh, and and the Egypt, I might add as well. So I think the whole concept uh, of this last uh, uh, last few months of uh, upsetting of the prices or the collapse of the hydrocarbons prices and so forth is something that uh, uh, if we look at it with the depth of time that uh, this industry takes uh, uh, the years for any final investment decision, the years for, let's say, building and construction, uh, we might uh, see that uh, we will be ready. I think the objective would be for everyone to be ready to, to capture the opportunity that comes following that. Uh, your mic is muted. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so if I may go back to Mr. Manolis to ask about uh, his take at DEPA about uh, potential delays in the exploration uh, uh, work increase and uh, how that might uh, uh, affect the East Med pipeline. And, and if I may just add uh, one more question here. Um, how about Italy's participation in the project? Is it like consider, considered uh, um, substantial like a necessary condition for the success of the project well uh, I, I will start from the from, from the easy part the first one so um, um, how can prices affect I mean it has been mentioned uh, mr. Rigas has mentioned before by mr. Steinitz and by others uh, these are long, uh, long-run projects. Uh, just to make a small, uh, a small recall on what we have been uh, doing all these years. Uh, I mean, the, conceptually, uh, we have started uh, the, the project in 2012 uh, with the support. Then in 2014, uh, they has uh, have joined us in, in, in the Eastnet project, also the Italian Edison. So, talking about just making. Um, a link to the participation of other of, of, of an Italian company in the project. So we, we have started first of all from 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 feasibility, performing all the necessary engineering studies, uh, making uh, a competitiveness assessment uh, with other expert options. Uh, we have uh, also uh, looked around uh, in, in, into the market, meaning the final the destination market that would be Greece and um, Central Europe, Italy and Central Europe, uh, but also we have assessed the market uh, of constructors and of uh, uh, materials that are needed, of pipes, for example, that are needed for constructing, uh, for building this pipeline. And, and uh, thanks for that, we had an initial support from uh, the European Union that amounted at uh, 2 million euros at that time. And we have successfully completed this phase, coming to the results that I have mentioned before. Uh, now. Uh, so the project is technically feasible and competitive uh, and uh, economically viable. 
now we are we are we have passed starting from 2018 when we have signed the second um, grant agreement with the European Union the so-called FID phase uh, that uh, includes a lot uh, and we need at least two to three years to, to, to come up to, to, to a position to take a decision and start construction so we need to, to complete all the engineering and, and permitting we are in, in full contact with uh, upstream producers uh, because we need to get into contact the final markets with uh, with, uh, with the producers of gas. Uh, just to mention, and, and I would like to make a reference, and I would like to thank also to, 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 for the support of uh, Minister Steins and, and Minister Hadzidakis and Minister Lakotritis. In November, we have signed uh, a, a memorandum of understanding with NGL, and the idea uh, is, as Mr. Riga said before, there is gas in the area, uh, and, and gas to has, that has to be exported because we need also diversification not only of prices, but the precipitation also of routes. So, uh, we are uh, planning now this new project to be connected to the Israeli grid in order to, to benefit of the, to, of the Israeli grid to, to work as a gas aggregator in order to, to, to fill in the, the gas that has to be needed in order to take FID. Uh, we're looking for partnerships. Well, we, we will have to define it is a complex uh, project also from uh, since it starts, it involves Israel, Cyprus, uh, Greece, uh, Italy. Let's not uh, take out of the picture uh, Italy because uh, uh, the Eastman pipeline ends to Greece, but then there is the Poseidon offshore pipeline that, will, that is already uh, authorized and that will connect the offshore section from the northwestern Greece um, area in Festrotia, will uh, connect uh, the the gas coming from the Eastern Mediterranean region uh, to Italy and then onwards to, um, to the Central and European markets. So, a lot of a lot of things have to be done. We are perfectly on, on, on track. As mentioned before, uh, we have, according to schedule, awarded all the technical contracts and we're ready in the detailed marine survey. We're ready to, to award very soon the environmental and social impact assessment studies, both for the offshore and onshore section. And then uh, we have already made a project execution plan that includes to perform all the, the para in parallel necessary activities covering uh, financing, uh, the regulatory framework, and in order to meet the market with uh, the producers. Coming to the, to the second part, uh, I think uh, I, I think that um, the uh, involvement of of not of, uh, of 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 Italy is something that has to be addressed at the political level. For sure, what we have uh, all of us to recall and to register that uh, yes, for the time being, Italy has not signed the uh, trilateral intergovernmental agreement, but has made a very st a very strong declaration of the full support it provides to to the project. Thank you. Um, moving on to how you and anyone else who wants to take the Italy question, please go ahead. Given that uh, there there have been um, um, kind of discussions uh, or uh, analysts who suggest that maybe the uh, southeastern European market might be uh, a, a, an alternative should Italy uh, decide not to move ahead. Uh, uh, with the project, and I know this is speculative for now. I just wanted your business perspective on whether that would be a big enough market for the EastMed pipeline to make sense uh, to begin with. Uh, and uh, anyone who wants to take it, please do in the next session. But I, I would like to also uh, ask you about how you are adjusting your strategy. Uh, amid uh, the pandemic and i know it's a short-term question but uh, how long do you think that uh, uh what is your projection for uh the recovery of uh, the energy uh mar the energy market and the price i guess and we have a, a technical question that i think it, it should be um asked as well whether how are you estimating resources available for export uh, if you can also answer that. Uh, Mr. Zomer, do you, do you want to start? I just, 
Um, you're talking about strategy or recovery. I think, um, uh, first of all, as uh, as Matteo said, uh, quoting uh, Minister Steinitz, that these are, are long-term projects. And I'll just quote uh, Assistant Secretary Fannin, who said the, uh, the clouds of uh, COVID, COVID will disperse. And I think uh, uh, we're very uh, uh, bullish on... Uh, on these discoveries, uh, finding uh, markets, uh, and I think we first of all um, we can look close uh, here. I know in, in Israel, if we see uh, uh, just immediate uh, reduction in coal, it's uh, it's an export project, and uh, and we'll be uh, competing for that uh, for that market, and, and we think that could happen uh, now uh, with very little investment. Um, I think. Um, uh, governments have have a role to play here in in transparency and, and making these and uh, helping uh, this recovery occur, but um, you know th there certainly is going to be a uh, maybe uh, a bit of a delay, and I and I don't think anyone really knows uh, how long that's uh, that's going to be, uh, but uh, I think if you look kind of over the next uh, uh, decade and even beyond, uh, you know I think. Uh, there was there was talk about uh, natural gas being kind of that bridge fuel, and I, and I think uh, I think uh, Assistant Secretary Fannin said it right about it just being uh, that transitional fuel and the uh, and 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 being able to work with current fuel supplies and, and future technologies as well. And I think it, you know there's a question as to uh, as to how long that bridge uh, is going to be. Uh, and some of us might think it's going to be longer uh, than others, but I think we all agree that that bridge needs to be uh, sturdy. And I think uh, um, I think that it will be, and I think that it will be for you know for a long time through this recovery and beyond. And so, uh, in the short term, I don't know how long these short term uh, fixes are going to be, but in the long term, uh, we have a growing uh, global population that's going to be that's uh, increasingly. Uh, uh, richer and uh, needs energy and natural gas is going to play a part of that and so there's no question that both uh, within the region and globally Eastern Med Gas will, will find a home and so I think we're all going to continue to uh, move forward with these projects uh, at uh, maybe at, uh, at uh, different paces uh, but uh, we think that this gas will find a home. Thank you. And if I might turn to Mr. Rigas for the same question and your business strategy uh, amid the pandemic and going forward and export, export outlook for you. I know that uh, Energian has, uh, is on track to produce from the Caris field uh, and uh, most of it will is projected to go to the Israeli market for now. But I, 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 want, uh, I, I would like to have your outlook for a longer term as well. Thank you. Well, uh, our strategy has not been affected by the pandemic. The pandemic uh, has affected the way we work and the way we live, but all our operating sites and our main development project have not been affected by what is going on with the coronavirus situation. I can tell you that we completed all the drilling operations. We drilled four wells in Israel without any issues. Uh, and we are now laying a pipeline, a 24 inch pipeline that will connect the shore of Israel with the uh, FPS that we're building. We had made a proposal to Cyprus to continue laying the same pipeline and supply also Cyprus, but Cyprus selected uh, not to uh, to listen to the proposal and uh, elected to uh, build an FPSO and import gas, gas that could have been either produced from the country or imported from Israel. But uh, that is something that uh, Mr. Cassianidis can comment on later. So our uh, strategy for the region is very simple. Uh, we move fast. We develop resources because we are totally committed to this region. And as an example, I will tell you that from the date that we got the approval by the Israeli government uh, to develop Karish and Tanin, within six months, six months from the approval of the development plan, we took the final investment decision for a $2 billion project. So when government want, governments want to help and assist and companies are committed to projects, projects happen. Now, I'll give you a regional perspective of what is going on because you asked before about the delays in exploration in Greece. Greece started its efforts to open the country to exploration 
country was totally closed. We were the only company producing hydrocarbons, still are. And uh, from 2015, we had new entries into the country. So Repsol from Spain, Total from France, Exxon from the US, all came to Greece to uh, start exploring for hydrocarbons. Recently, we saw Total exit block two. We picked up their block for their own reasons. They decided to leave the block and focus on uh, the southern part of Greece. What we're hearing is that there's going to be delays in drilling those wells because it's a frontier area that hasn't yet proven its success. But we are there and we're committed to continue the agenda and find the oil and gas that exists in the country. Moving further down to Cyprus, Cyprus has discovered, I remind everyone, gas with Aphrodite over a decade ago. And still Cyprus burns diesel. So people have to think why this happened. And Noble, that has made these great discoveries in the region and has developed Karish, has developed, sorry, um, Tamar and Leviathan with huge success in Israel, is there to develop resources. Look at Israel. Israel, 10 years ago, was a country relying 100% on coal and imported gas from, uh, from Egypt. And with the support of the government, the commitment of the operators, both Noble and us that entered the, the market very recently, has turned into be self-sufficient and will be exporting gas. So the key message here is that you need to have governments that are committed, that support the operators, but you also need to have committed operators that want to develop projects and invest money. So our strategy is very simple. We are committed to the Mediterranean. We operate today in eight countries. We are investing over $2 billion in the East Mediterranean right now. We are developing the only project that is under development at the moment uh, in the region. And we want, of course, to continue supplying gas to Israel. We want to continue competing with uh, Noble, Delek, and the other players in the country. And we want to export the vast amount of natural resources that exist in the region. That can happen either through uh, the LNG terminals in Egypt, the, the East Med pipeline that, as we discussed before, we are part of through the agreement with TEPA. And since Turkey was discussed, when and if uh, the markets open there, obviously that is a huge market for everyone. So we view the East Med as a key part of uh, the energy world that will be and supply of gas to the region. And of course, there's a lot of discussion about green energy and the transition to the green uh, to the green world. We were the first ENP company in the world to commit to be a net zero emitter by 2050. We did that in December of 2019. So we're totally committed to becoming a net zero uh, greenhouse gas emission producer. And we're doing, we're taking active steps for the, in the next three years to reduce our greenhouse emissions by um, 70% and then get to net zero later. But the world will need gas. I have no doubt that the world will need gas, the world will need hydrocarbons in the foreseeable future. So what we need to do is produce those hydrocarbons for the countries that we live and operate. And a prime example is Italy, and you mentioned Italy. We operate in Italy through the acquisition of the Edison EMP portfolio. Italy has decided to ban exploration and production of hydrocarbons and chose to import. So you have a country that can produce oil and gas, and I will focus on gas, but instead chooses to import this gas from other, from other countries, but still burns gas. So in this crazy world that we live in, gas will play a major role. The winners are going to be the countries that understand this, that promote the development of gas resources and find ways to export and serve the other countries. In my humble opinion, the losers are going to be those that just stay on the agenda of you know, marketing and using nice words about the green environment, which is absolutely necessary for us to get to. There's no doubt about it. But until we get there, it is better for countries to produce their own gas rather than import it. And that is the strategy that we're following. We're trying to help governments produce their own resources. Thank you. And uh, before I turn the floor to Mr. Garcianidis, I would like to ask you if you think that uh, uh, the European uh, Investment Bank decision to not invest going forward uh, in uh, such projects, does it uh, undermine uh, this uh, 
prospects for gas that you are uh, you're just describing, especially in regards to, of course, European Union countries? Uh, Katerina, thanks for the question. Uh, obviously, when we see big multilateral organizations like the EIB uh, deciding to focus only on green investments, it is alarming. But I can tell you that in the last three years, we have raised over $4 billion from capital markets, equity and debt, from our IPO that we did in uh, 2019 in, uh, in London, on the London Stock Exchange, where today the largest independent DNP listed on the London Stock Exchange, the debt that we raised for the project in Israel. So money is available. And what is happening today is funds are moving to, a, to tick all the boxes of an ESG, environment, social and governance world, uh, to make sure that they comply with uh, an ESG strategy, but also funds and banks still want to make a return. So my message is very clear. You can find capital for projects as proven by the fact that we are, and we're not a major company, we are an independent ENP company uh, and funding major projects in the region. So yes, it is alarming, but still projects uh, get significant support. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Kassianidis, if I may turn to you, what is uh, the rationale on uh, the uh, LNZ terminal in Cyprus that uh, Mr. Rivas also mentioned? And uh, can you tell us, can you tell us about your strategy going forward and the progress that you, uh, you've made in uh, Cyprus? I understand that longer term, the prospect of a pipeline is also open, uh, but please give us your take. Uh, please uh, unmute your mic. Thank, thank you for your question and the opportunity to give you an update of where we are. Uh, I will not go into a debate with uh, Mr. Rigas about the offer that they have made. I think it's outside the scope of the forum because also Noble has expressed interest and others have expressed interest as well. So, but I have to say that what I will agree with him is that Cyprus for the last 10 years has had uh, to face the question of how to uh, introduce uh, gas in the energy mix of uh, Cyprus and how to move Cyprus in the new gas era. Uh, I'm in a very happy position to announce that on Friday we gave the notice to proceed to the consortium. Uh, so the consortium has now acknowledged the notice to proceed and the project is progressing. Uh, and they have a delivery timeline to deliver, let's say, gas to the Electricity Authority of Cyprus in July 2022. So hopefully we will not be discussing about the long-term ineffective plans of the Cyprus Republic uh, for much longer, because actually we will be maybe the second project that is actually being implemented. Uh, this is the funding has been secured and the definition and choice of uh, how this uh, project was uh, manifested uh, is clearly because we've had a 40% grant from the European Union through the Connecting Europe facility. Uh, and uh, that uh, effectively uh, dictated in a way that Cyprus needs to own and operate its own uh, facilities. And that was done on the basis of the security of supply and the security of supply was defined at the time through a project, which our project includes an FSRU, uh, a jetty, a pipeline, and they're all, let's say, resources and uh, will be owned by the government of uh, Cyprus. The funding for the project is about 300 million euro. About 100 uh, come from, uh, let's say, the, uh, uh, the European Union as the grant. 43 has come from the Electricity Authority, who has bought equity in the infrastructure company. And then the rest, which uh, with a very good uh, ratio of debt to equity, and let's say with a very favorable uh, terms from various European institutions, uh, which uh, will be something to discuss over the next coming period. We, the project is well financed and, uh, and has actually now officially uh, started. In terms of the impact of COVID-19 and so forth, the truth, is that it has caused some delay, and this is the period where we have had the delay uh, for mobilization and, and doing the different things, but now the project is on track and full steam ahead for completion. Uh, then uh, as soon as now that we have given the notice to proceed, 
Uh, soon uh, after, we'll follow with the invitation for the supply, for the second stage, for the supply of gas. And I will mention we have 22 uh, interested companies, internationally uh, interested companies that are participating in the tender that want to supply gas at very, very favorable terms for the Republic of Cyprus. Uh, that, uh, to make it uh, even more extend, I think, uh, uh, it, depending on how the cycle works, uh, the cycle works, uh, if the prices remain low, it will be to the benefit of the consumer because we will end up having a lower electricity price with very competitive LNG prices. If the prices increase, then the, the hopefully the FID will be taken between Noble and the, uh, and the Republic of Cyprus to develop Aphrodite, and then it is a different uh, ball game altogether. Now, what happens is, as far as DEFA's plan and strategy is concerned in the future, uh, we've had, uh, we have been approached by different, uh, uh, let's say, entities and uh, interested parties, economic operators for uh, supplying gas in different forms and so forth. We have a project that uh, has been vetted by the European Union, uh, has been funded by the European Union, the government has shown the necessary commitment and decisiveness to implement what has been agreed with, uh, and this is what we are implementing. Once uh, the process starts, then we can enter discussion with others that want to help the whole process and help Cyprus move forward in the new era of gas and make the advantage. The current infrastructure is based on very uh, minimum quantities that uh, we're talking about less than one BCM, which is the expected uh, Cyprus demands. But let's say once we have methanization, then we believe that the demand will increase and that will open the opportunities for cooperation with other operators, uh, including uh, anyone who may have uh, interest. So okay. I think with that, I'll close. Uh, thank you so much, and I'm conscious of everyone's time again, but uh, I want to close this discussion with your take on a provocative statement that I read on the Israeli press the other day, which was that uh, the East Met gas party is over before it began. It's arguing that even if prices recover, uh, the halt in development uh, will close the window of opportunity. I guess they're not... Um, um, estimating, they're not projecting the strength in the gas market that uh, Mr. Rigas is projecting. But uh, uh, what is, uh, Mr. Zomer, what is your take on this? Yeah. Well, first, uh, if you live in Israel long enough, you know that uh, uh, the Israeli press is, is wrong way more often than they are right. And I don't know if that's uh, unique, uh, unique to Israel, but certainly, uh, I, I don't know where you read it, but I can only suspect and uh, uh, and I'll tell you, is the Israeli press uh, said that exports to Jordan would never happen, and that exports to Egypt would never happen, uh, and that Leviathan would never be developed, uh, and certainly wouldn't be developed on time. And so it was developed. Uh, it was developed on time, uh, and exports to Jordan happen, and exports and are happening, and exports to Egypt happening are happening, and uh, uh, they should not over. Uh, uh, what did Mark Twain say? The, the rumors of my death have been highly exaggerated, and I think that that is uh, uh, certainly true of that statement. That's a good um, I think the uh, the Eastern Med um, the Eastern Med uh, discoveries and market uh, have a uh, have a bright future. Uh, we have governments in the region that are committed uh, to making it happen, and we have. Uh, 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 more importantly, uh, investors uh, who are uh, willing to invest and move it forward. And, uh, and I think uh, ultimately uh, there's a demand to be met. And I think when you have all of those things, uh, then uh, um, success is, is inevitable. And so uh, I think uh, we, uh, all of us uh, will share in that success. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to being part of that story as it unfolds. Thank you. Uh, we have to close unless someone has uh, uh, something to add. Uh, uh, please ra raise your hand if you if you do. Otherwise, uh, yes, Mr. Manolis, please. Uh, 
great presence of the regional anthems waiting in the background. Uh, yes, please let me. Uh, I, I would, yeah, I would like to close so by by being optimistic, and uh, I am really optimistic. Coming to to our project, I need, I need to add, I need to to say that it, it, it fully covers both of the criteria set by um, the EU in terms of uh, diversification of uh, supply sources of supply for Europe, but also for diversification of uh, of, of routes. So we're talking about uh, the the Levantine Basin, the Eastern Mediterranean um, uh, region, is an adjacent uh, source to the EU. Uh, it will help to ter terminate isolation of Cyprus. And uh, I, I firmly believe that one of the most important things is that will provide stability uh, in, in the area. Thank you so much. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time today, and thank you for participating in this virtual three plus one, as I like to call it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If we may, we will continue. Oh, we we will continue straight to our next panel with uh, the presidents of uh, the. Uh, Amtams of Greece, Cyprus, and Israel. We're already connected with Mr. Bakatselos in Athens, uh, Haris Kakoulis in Cyprus, and Odette Rose uh, in Israel. Uh, welcome, gentlemen, and uh, again, uh, thank you so much for your contribution to this event. I think it's uh, a, a great testament to uh, one important aspect of the trilateral partnership, which is the cooperation between your three, uh, uh, the three AMTAMs, your three organizations. Um, I would like your membership's perspective on the energy opportunities for the three countries more generally, and, and uh, your suggestions on ways to expand this collaboration in the region and with the US, as of course uh, uh, the AMTAMs have this uh, uh, important mandate as well in, in the chamber. Uh, may I start with uh, our host, Mr. Pakatsalos? First of all, let me start by saying a huge thank you, Katerina, for moderating what has been a very interesting uh, discussion, I think. And perhaps I speak, I think I speak on behalf of everyone when I say that uh, uh, we should repeat this again in the future with the same format and um, the other thing i wanted to say is i'm very happy to see my colleagues from uh, israel and cyprus last time we met was uh, in israel in in february it seems like a decade my friends with all the things that have uh, passed since then anyway uh, uh, let me answer uh, very briefly uh katarina's question i think um, that we have uh, it's it, common interest and uh, we, we particularly with this uh, case we are transitioning from uh, other kinds of fuel to more clean energy so uh, the the natural gas can be used as an interim fuel towards renewable uh, energy and uh, I think there's a lot of interest also in the electrification of uh, transportation so uh, with all that, uh, what I'm trying to say is that the, the idea of setting up a, a, an energy center in the, in the region is, is a fantastic idea. We can share uh, technology, we can uh, share expertise, and of course the involvement with the U.S. is, is hugely uh, important, it's valuable. Now we, we, we have, as the, the Chamber, seen uh, this, uh, this, the benefits of, of, of this collaboration, and uh, we have signed an MOU already between the, our three chambers with uh, the idea of fostering and enhancing business relations uh, between our countries. Uh, let me just say one last thing uh, about the Energy Center and, and, uh, and our membership. Uh, we have presented this at the, uh, at the um, a, a gathering of our energy committee and, and most of the companies that represent uh, that are represented in the, the committee showed great interest in, in pursuing um, this uh, uh, the creation of this center and and of course Katarina, you know very well that we have signed an agreement with the Atlantic Council uh, in in pursuit of, of uh, and, and enhancing this uh, incentive. Right, so Mr. 
Mr. Rose for his uh, for his take, and uh, of course uh, for our viewers as well. Uh, Mr. Bagatello mentioned the um, the East Med Act and uh, its idea of a U.S. East Med Energy Center to share um, technology and expertise between the private sector uh, and uh, the academia as well. Um, to focus on the region. Uh, that's just one of the ideas out there, but I, I thought it made perfect sense. Uh, so, Mr. Rosen, to you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, thank you for the organizers, for uh, Nikos and uh, his colleagues, and uh, for the Atlantic Council for inviting us and for letting us be part of this. Uh, our chamber has about 250 members. They make up about a third of the Israeli economy, so uh, quite large companies. Nobel Energy and Bini Zomer uh, is a member of our board, of course. And uh, we are um, very happy to do all this cooperation. We started a year and a half ago, as uh, Nikos mentioned, with signing the MOU. We, uh, we held a session on cooperation in our recent uh, February uh, business summit. Uh, Israel-America Business Summit, and I was very happy to host my my colleagues from uh, from Greece and from Cyprus. And um, uh, we have a very strong energy committee that uh, works on various energy issues. And I want to mention, because we talked all about energy this uh, last two hours, I want to mention that we, we can cooperate on other areas, many other areas. And I just want to mention a few areas that we are working here in Amcham, Israel, uh, one is uh, we have a very strong pharma and bioconvergence committee that works on solutions right now, actually working on solutions for the, for the COVID epidemic and many other health health tech solutions. That's an area that I think we should do a lot more cooperation in this region. Uh, there's a lot of similarities, and we we need to do more of that in the pharma and healthcare. Uh, uh, areas. Another one is in smart cities. C cities are now uh, overwhelmed with the uh, with the coronavirus um, uh, crisis, and we need to find uh, together solutions for to help cities uh, uh, deal with the, with the crisis. And I think there's a great area of cooperation here. Uh, and another one that we are very uh, very much focused on the last couple of years is how the future of the work is going to look with the advent of new technologies like AI, like uh, automation, like robotics, how it's going to affect our jobs, not our jobs, but perhaps in the, in the chambers, but most of the jobs in the world. And we, we are doing a great project now with uh, uh, 10 Israeli ministries and uh, other authorities and the chamber and the academia and even the army. And we are looking at how to work together to get ready for this changing workplace that is changing very rapidly already now with the pandemic. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Kakoulis, uh, over to you uh, about energy prospects for cooperation. And since uh, Mr. Rose took it for to the future as well, another um, forms of cooperation, I should note uh, uh, the tourism, uh, that uh, tourism is also one, uh, um, one sector that during the crisis, uh, of COVID-19 has been uh, on the focus of all three countries to create a safe corridor for the citizens of its country to travel this summer. Uh, but uh, please give us your, uh, your take from Cyprus. Thank you, Katarina, and thank you for giving me the opportunity and um, uh, representing Amcham Cyprus to be part of this event. Uh, thank you to Nikos Bagatselos and his team for uh, taking the initiative and um, um, uh, creating this event, which uh, in my view, it's extremely uh, successful. Um, as Amcham Cyprus, our members and our board of directors are very uh, excited about the energy process in the area and um, the opportunities unfolding. And basically um, uh, the three plus one that has been mentioned before is something that we believe a lot and we hope and we um, expect that the American presence and the engagement in the area will continue. Um, so with respect to um, energy and how it can affect the area, I think we've, we've heard a lot. We've heard about the progress uh, being done uh, so far, uh, the analysis uh, um, 
as to when uh, the final investment decision will be taken in two years and um, um, and the reasons. All these um, related to energy are very important uh, in fostering um, an environment of growth, uh, of economic growth in the area, which will fuel um, many sectors, including tourism, uh, including technology and other areas that uh, my other two esteemed colleagues mentioned. Um, with respect to tourism in Cyprus, um, I, I, I believe that um, the Cyprus government here took some very correct and, and immediate measures to protect the population. And uh, uh, besides beside the fact that you, we protected the population here in Cyprus, we make sure that Cyprus as a destination of tourism is going to be one of the safest, not in the area, but in the world. So basically uh, we proved to our um, associates, to our um, uh, to other countries or to other um, organizations that we cooperate, uh, that we can be very serious uh, in, in this kind of um, matters and we can protect not only our citizens, but also their citizens. So I believe now Cyprus um, has a good, um, I guess, um, uh, setup uh, to uh, accept tourism from other countries. And uh, we hope everything goes well. We hope that uh, tourists um, dare to go out of their countries and enjoy uh, the good weather, not only here in Cyprus, but in Greece and Israel, the weather is pretty much the same. So I believe that, um, uh, you know, it's uh, hopefully it's time now for people to uh, to to enjoy uh, this time, and uh, hopefully um, the businesses related and connected to tourism can can exploit this. If I can also further add that, besides energy, um, I believe that the two the three countries can further uh, cooperate in, in the areas of healthcare and in the areas of education. Particularly education is something that if uh, universities cooperate with each other, if they have a framework that they, that they can work together, uh, you can have um, many uh, uh, um, innovations and uh, new startups uh, coming out of there. And this is how you create new business, and this is how eventually uh, you can foster growth. Um, the the uh, points that have been mentioned before about renewable energy, um, I believe these are very good areas, and the plan of Israel to uh, in the future to focus to the 70 versus 30 percent. Uh, it's extremely uh, important. I believe the European Union is trying to do similar, uh, uh, has similar targets, maybe not at that point, but I think similar. So this would trigger eventually um, other, uh, you know, uh, uh, similar industries to, to grow, like, uh, I guess, the uh, storage of energy and um, other similar areas. So I am optimistic about what um, what we are going to face in the future and hope uh, the energy sector grows and uh, pushes further the growth in the area. Well, today we certainly saw the value added uh, of your regional expertise and uh, cooperation in bringing this event together. Uh, so, uh, and I have to say before I turn it to Nicolas to, uh, to close the session, I'm... Uh, um, I'm grateful for the fact that dinner in the Eastern Mediterranean is later than uh, in North America because uh, we can still have you uh, with us and uh, uh, it wouldn't necessarily work the other way around. So I'm uh, grateful for your time today and thank you for participating and uh, contributing to, make, uh, to making this event. Uh, Nicola, over to you. Katrina, thank you. Uh, I, I would like to say, I would like to mention this, uh, made an impression on me when I when I visited Tel Aviv in, in February, and it relates to the future as well. It's not about the kind of businesses and the know-how that we can exchange between our countries, but it's also about the mentality. I was really surprised 
by uh, what was going on in, in Tel Aviv. This startup nation that is Israel was fantastic. And I think that if, they, if we can learn from them, we can grow, we can evolve, we can become better. I'd like to thank everybody that uh, took part in, in today's digital conversation. Katerina, primarily you, you spent uh, two hours moderating this very, very interesting and, uh, and I hope, as I said before, that we will be able to repeat it. I would like to thank the team here at Anja, Les Petunias, our managing director, and Nike G, uh, who was also involved in, uh, in preparing the, the discussion. And thank everybody who attended. I think we had at some point 200 concurrent uh, viewers. So, a success. Well done, Katerina. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank yes. you. Welcome, Katarina. Thank you for everything.